advocate. We will be without Stephen tonight. He uh, called me earlier and said he had to take his wife somewhere. I hope I hope he didn't mean like you know to bury her or anything. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, we're on. We're going to continue our conversation tonight with uh, Tom Fusco, who is being camera shy this week. And uh, we're going to pick up where we left off and talk about uh, all sorts of things. So, Thomas, how are you doing tonight? Oh, great, David. Thanks. Yourself? Oh, I'm hanging in there. Believe me, I'm running around from one interview to the next to the next. What so a man. Life, life is getting insane. Um, so, let's see. When we left off, we were talking about all sorts of things. But we went over on last week's show because we got into an interesting conversation. Pretty much because Stephen was stirring the uh, shit pot. So um, let's try to pick up. Now, we are going to take a bullet list of your theory. And we are going to work off that bullet list and start designing specific experiments to prove each item listed that's the backstory to this whole thing so uh, and we were discussing your trip to the symposium and uh, let's just jump right back in and pick up not even necessarily where we left off let's just grab a piece of turf and start working it out all right David uh, with the bullet list I've started to work on it and you know you know how sometimes when you uh, you go to work on something, you envision it being a certain way. And then when you start working on it... <laughs> it doesn't turn out that way. Yeah, it's like, you know, <laughs> this isn't really fleshing out in the kind of form that I was uh, yeah, imagining it. So what it began to uh, uh, take the form of is kind of a, uh, almost like a scientific paper. And, yeah. That's, you that's know, okay, but... My request is is that we keep each subject at least compartmentalized uh -huh. so, so we can pick like a paragraph for each item so that we can pick that paragraph out to be the um, preamble, if you will, mm -hmm. to a specific set of experiments or a specific experiment. That was yeah. my only – I mean you know, how I was doing it before was reading through your book and trying to do it that way and that's very cumbersome for me. Um, reading your book and enjoying it is not cumbersome. However, <laughs> reading your book and trying to design an experiment becomes a, a system of page flipping back and forth. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, I started to uh, uh, write this down, and then I uh, realized that, well, gee, Tom, you kind of really, you do have to com uh, uh, compartmentalize it, like, like you said, David. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, it needs to take a logical form, a logical sequence. This is A, this exactly. is B, this is C. Right. And so that's where it began to uh, uh, kind of take on the form of a, of a paper. But it'll still be in, in kind of an outline form. Yeah, uh, that, that, that was um, really, you know, I, I didn't expect you to bullet point it, to be honest. Um, that would be like me trying to bullet, bullet point, you know, my theory. It's really just not possible. It's more like paragraph assemblage mm -hmm. and then assembling each paragraph in the proper order, you know? Yeah. That, that's a, what I'm sure you're dealing with. Yeah. Information, big bang, spooks, gooks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh... Have you had a chance to watch any of the new show? Mm, no. <laughs> I, I, well, first well, of well you don't get it, number one. But I will say they, uh, they have it on Amazon now to where you can download it to your computer. And I think it's like $1.99 uh, an episode. I see. And, and once you pay for it, of course, you know, you can watch it as many times as you want. But um, <laughs> yeah. and, and they do that so that, you know, it, it makes up for the lack of sponsorship that they have on the TV. 
you know, you know they're going to have to make a little bit of money off of it. But a dollar ninety nine per episode is not so bad because you don't have to sit through you know tons of commercials and stuff like when you're watching at home. But anyway, if you do get a chance, you can go to the website at Destination America, and my clips are actually the teasers. Oh. So they're using me. They're using the majority of my FaceTime as the teaser clip. Now they have a teaser clip of the guys doing stuff too. Um, uh-huh. So, but so far, each one of my segments is almost in full as a teaser clip. So it will give you a pretty good overview of where I'm going with all of this. Well, that's good. Um, what What happened on the first episode? We had the EMF quadrilator operating. And we actually picked up a response when a medium was asking a question to whatever was there. And that sort of demonstrated, and we only saw one of them, and it happened numerous times during the, the filming. But they only showed one because they only had time to show one. But what that demonstrated was not only this emerging background information, but there was a human interaction on that. In yes. other words, when the human person interacted with whatever was there, we had a dramatic alteration in the waveform. And it was almost a pattern between two different sensors. And it showed two out-of-phase spikes in opposite directions, so almost triangular in shape, that crossed both sensors. It was almost like both sensor inputs, you know, spanned across. Yeah, that's on that, uh, that's on that YouTube clip that you yeah, said that too. Yeah, the YouTube clip has that on there, but uh, that that was that was literally on the TV station website or the TV network website on you know destinationamerica dot com. Now, the second episode also shows a good portion <clears throat> of my segment, and what we did on that one was is I used smoke, theatrical smoke, and a laser system, and we started out using like these little three milliwatt pens or whatever, like they use on the other TV shows that I won't mention. But the problem with those is they're not powerful enough to print over the IR wash that we were using to light up the room. So you couldn't see it. And what's so important about all of this, and if we do experiments, I want to videotape them. It's got to be visual to the people watching it or... You, they're taking your word for an explanation. Mm-hmm. So a lot of what I had to do was to make it very visual in the design of the experiment. So we ended up using these fairly powerful lasers, and we projected a pattern. And then in the middle of it all, Chad, of course, got attacked by something, and his back got all scratched up, and that was pretty dramatic and stuff. But uh, towards the end of the episode, you see the fruits of the experiment, because what actually happened was... Some type of shadow creature or object or person sort of peeked up. Yeah, figure. Action figure. figure. Sort of peeked up over the far wall. And when they peeped up over the wall, it blocked out the laser beam. You didn't see the laser beam print on it. Mm -hmm. What you saw was the laser beam being obscured by it, almost like it was being absorbed. But at the same time, if you look at it closely, it became almost backlit for a brief moment. And you see a silhouette of it from being lit from behind, and there was no light source behind it. And what's even funnier is where that takes place. There's like a three-foot deep pile of construction debris. A person can't even get to where that figure was without climbing over boards, you know, that are all helter-skelter and different types of sheetrock and just crap that's piled there. Uh So I couldn't even go there during the test when I was demonstrating how it would print on a human body no matter where you were in the room. I tried to walk over to the other side of that wall, couldn't get to it because of all the crap that's in there. And, of course, it was pitch dark, so you couldn't see without a flashlight. And the guys are using their cameras to see with because they can't see an IR light, so they're having to look in their camera viewfinder to navigate, to even walk around in there. Right, right. But but what that demonstrated is I had proposed that shadow people may be a form of anti-photonic life form, where, you know, human beings, we generate photons. We emit photons from our DNA at a cellular level. 
And I also mentioned about the Rhyme Center doing uh, all this research, and that never got on either after I reviewed the evidence. I mentioned the Rhyme Center has a photon counter where they're counting ultraviolet photons. Right. And they have created a black room. And in this black room, under normal conditions, there may be three or four photons per second that are emitted. And that's just leakage from not being able to totally seal the room. When they take a healer or a martial artist or a medium and put them in the room and then tell them to do their thing, the UV levels go off the wall. So that's telling us that we are creatures of light. We are emitting light, at least in the ultraviolet spectrum. So I had proposed from having seen shadow people in the past and having encountered them myself, I, I had proposed that perhaps they're based off of an anti-photonic life form. Maybe they're from a different dimension or set of dimensions. Maybe, you know, who knows where they're from or what they are, but I don't consider them to be a ghost. They're something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and I propose that maybe that they are an anti-photonic based life form. And then that brought up the question, when this thing rose up, and hit that laser beam, it withdrew dramatically quick. And so I'm wondering, did an annihilation occur? Did it cause it pain because of the light hitting it and the, the uh, annihilation of the photons and the antiphotons when they came together? I had been, It opened up a whole new series of questions from just that simple discovery. I suspect, and the reason I'm going through this long diatribe, I suspect when we begin doing these experiments that each of these experiments are going to open up a whole nother series of questions. So yes. what I'm thinking is, is we need to do a first run and tabulate. In other words, not keep exploring, but design the same entry level, first level experiment throughout the paper. In other words, we'll do an experiment for each thing and then tabulate that information and then come back after we do the whole thing and start with the second tier based on the data collected in the first one and do the same thing all the way through. And the reason that I'm saying to do it, that we should do it that way, is the fact that we don't know what the other data down the path is going to do to affect the data in the first set. Mm -hmm. We may make discoveries two or three bullet points down that reflect back on the first bullet point. So we want to make sure we do all of the first level experiments first, tabulate all that data before we design the second tier, because we may get more information as we go down the line. I see what you're saying. Uh, when you were, uh, you had mentioned something early on uh, speaking about this uh, shadow figure. Right. That at one point it looked like it was almost backlit. Yeah, it was really weird. It was almost like there was a back radiation of light that for a brief instant, and I mean like maybe at 30 frames per second, maybe 15 of those frames okay. is how, how long the duration was, half a second maybe. And it literally was almost like something glowed behind it just enough to sort of silhouette it to the camera. I see. So it uh, the the uh, luminous phenomenon uh, actually projected or extended beyond the perimeter of this figure. It, it what I want to say is is that the light literally penetrated the figure, and we were seeing perhaps a reflection of it off the wall behind it, and yet it did not print on the figure. And because of that, we ended up getting this kind of a, almost like a halo type of effect that clearly showed, it almost looked like a shoulder and an arm is what it looked like, if you look mm. at it closely. Interesting. You never, you never see enough of it to fully identify it. It's just kind of a little spindly thing. You know, when I first saw it, 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 it on the playback when I was doing the evidence review, I thought it was a head at first. Mm. But... There may be a head to the left of it still kind of in the darkness. The part that really comes up and obscures the laser beam looks like it could be an appendage of some kind. Mm. Well, the, the reason why I ask is because, uh, as you uh, know, 
super geometrics when it when it discusses a paranormal phenomenon actually has multiple layers of events occurring simultaneously. Exactly. So, for example, uh, we have uh, this formation of this expanding area of space-time, uh, you know, which I call the differential field bubble. Uh, I think your suggestion uh, of the opening of a an einstein rosen bridge, a wormhole, uh, is probably a more, how would I say it? it it's a more uh, tangible model. Uh, I, I think it's metaphorically easier to comprehend, too. You because know? we're looking, yeah, we're looking at... It, it because we're actually creating something of a bubble when that wormhole forms. Mm -hmm. It's almost like an inverse bubble, though. You know, instead of a outward bulge, it's more of an inward bulge, and I would love to get some kind of visual confirmation of that. Yes. Um, but um, we're going to use Soak in one more episode, and we had some very interesting results, and, and I'm not going to say any more about that, but we were in a much more confined space. The problem with using Soak in that room is that room was huge. Uh -huh. That room was probably 100 feet across by maybe 60 feet deep. And there just wasn't enough smoke from that small machine to properly saturate the room. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. So that part of it, the smoke part of it failed in that particular uh, application. But the laser part didn't. And that was key because that's telling me that that type of setup is going to be usable in the future for investigating areas where shadow people are reported. It will be a way for us to try to detect and, and, su and successfully be able to detect the presence of something like that. Mm -hmm. Now, we had, you know, ob obstructions in the way so we couldn't see a full figure. We could just see a partial manifestation. So the rest of it was obscured by the wall. You know, there was a half wall that ran. That room was divided up into small cubicle areas that beds were kept in. It was like the beds were all segregated into groups of three or four beds. Um, because of the nature of, you know, these people were insane and dangerous. Um, and they had partitions between the areas. Right. right. They had they had pretty much no more than four beds in a partitioned area. But the partitions only were about, uh, I'd say, like midriff high. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they were more like, they, were, they could be observed, you know, they could easily be observed, but they couldn't really move around that quickly without someone coming out and, and stopping them. So. Yeah, I would probably counter height about 42 inches, maybe. Probably was. It was probably a standard height of some kind because con contractors built it. But Sure, sure. Uh, what, uh, uh, see, the, the luminous effect you're talking about was, uh, you know, uh, caught my attention. Uh, that, that was a surprise. I mean, first of all, catching anything was a surprise because we didn't anticipate catching it. We were just prepared if we did. Sure. But the uh, the backlighting effect that occurred, uh, that really had me going because I really looked at that and said, what is the mechanic involved in this? Because this is not normal. Something is super normal with this because we're not seeing the light print on the figure, but we're almost like seeing, it's almost like it diffused the, the laser and spread it out to where it lit a larger area than the dot that it would normally be presenting. Mm -hmm. It was almost like whatever that material was diffused that laser into more of a wash than a pinpoint light mm -hmm. behind it. Well, uh, uh, for the uh, audience's, uh, uh, the listener's benefit, uh, again, uh, to uh, just to mention this thing about this uh, wormhole, uh, this opening of this wormhole, uh, my theory talks about an expanding differential field bubble in space-time. That's what I call it. Uh, but we've already compared enough notes, David, to know that uh, uh, both kinds of structures, what my theory calls a differential bubble and uh, an Einstein-Rosen opening, uh, seem to be physically identical. Exactly. We may be talking about the same thing using different terminology. Yes, and so one of the things, uh, uh, you know, it, it seems like a good model to uh, 
to begin with because there's some established uh, science and math on it. Well, um, which makes it easier to prove or disprove than a differential bubble. Yes. And, and if we can disprove that it's a wormhole, then that leaves us looking at this differential bubble. And by that time, hopefully some new technology will be available to try to map that. Yeah. What uh, supergeometry implies, though, if we are dealing with an Einstein-Rosen structure, uh, what supergeometry implies is that it is not, uh, these wormholes are not limited to joining uh, different locations within the same universal space-time. Exactly, which is also very, very important because it would support the idea that there are layers of reality. Mm -hmm. and, and how I like to put it, I know you're not a fan of the multiverse, but no. how, <laughs> how I like to put it is, is there... It's like, it's like a whole clothesline with eight or nine strings or ropes on it, and you've got sheets hanging on it. And each of those sheets is resonating at a different frequency. Um, the best way I could put it is the whole paper, the solo cups thing where you stack a bunch of cups together. Uh -huh. And you've got, in the center, you've got the cup that we're living in. And then you've got these cups above it and the cups below it. And the cups below it indicate a lower resonance and it's occupying the same space-time, but it's resonating at a lower frequency or a higher frequency than our own. Therefore, it's invisible to us. Yeah, it's not. It's not resonating in our senses, even though it's all around us. So, if we look at it that way, and and we stay away from the multiverse that you don't like to use that word. <laughs> uh, we're, we can call it different layers of reality within the same universe or different. Um, I, I like to look at it as layers of reality, because if you look at it that way, it doesn't matter what you call it. We've got all these different layers of reality, but we're stuck in this layer here and our senses stick us in that layer because our perception only allows us to see this layer. But we've got another layer that's right next to us and it's, actually occupying our same space but because it's resonating at a different frequency it's beyond the ability of our senses to detect it and this would also explain how certain gifted individuals get a glimpse of that because they're literally seeing maybe at a higher resonance or experiencing information from a higher resonance that's emerging or bleeding over into our own mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, with me, one of the issues that I have uh, with some of these, you know, kind of uh, cutting edge uh, ideas uh, like the multiverse or, or even string theory is that they're based on a concept that all of reality is material, well, that it is yeah. physical, and that, you know, you're trying to basically what I see is coming up with ideas, uh, trying to solve a puzzle inside of a box. And I maintain that the solution to the puzzle is not inside the box. It's outside of the box. And so consequently, this is why I have problems with some of these other ideas. Well, we live in the box is what the problem is. See, we exist inside that box, but there's all this other stuff outside the box. At least a portion of us lives inside the box. Right. And, and see, this is where quantum mechanics falls short because it doesn't complete the extension of that. You know, quantum mechanics talks about, you know, until the wave function collapses, everything is a probability. Mm -hmm. The reality that occurs is basically hinging upon the observer taking the measurement or seeing it or being present or witnessing it to create the reality. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that that goes beyond that, that the reality potential is all around us from all different directions and it's not dependent upon the observer. It's dependent upon something else. Mm -hmm. The observer has an effect and, and the observer has an influence perhaps on that reality that manifests, but it isn't the driving force behind that. Right. This is why, uh, um, you know, I propose uh, what I call a, a three-state reality. 
Whereas rather, you know, we have the fully materialized uh, relativistic state, we have the quantum state. If we add a non-physical or pre-physical or super-physical or super-geometric, whatever you'd like to conceive it as, if we add that particular state, then quantum, the quantum state becomes a transitional state. Well, it unifies, it unifies the physical and the quantum, which is what science has failed to do up to this point. Right, because, because it's followed a materialistic paradigm. Right, you have that segue from the quantum to the physical, and that non-physical or non-ordinary reality or what we, whatever we want to call it mm -hmm. is that segue. You know, that's the connecting link that allows the transition from quantum to physical. Yes. For example, when we have the, we talk about the two-slit experiment. Right. Where, you know, physicist David Bohm said, no physicist understands this. And he said the two-slit experiment is the only mystery of quantum physics. And the entire mystery of quantum physics is locked up into it. And uh, if we take a three-state reality where the quantum state is a, uh, a transitional state, then we can conceive that duality as being relativity in the process of materializing. Right. So therefore, space-time, in order to have a specific, if we have a particle, we have to have a basically a location in space-time for it just as a wave has frequency and amplitude. But if those dimensions are not yet fully unfolded, then we would see these kind of bizarre structures where we have wave-particle duality, where right. there, isn't, there isn't sufficient materialism for it to actually manifest as one thing or the other. But when we observe it, we corrupt that state with the relativistic state that we're observing from, and it's almost like shooting it with a freeze ray. We inject relativity into that quantum state and basically materialize it at a specific uh, uh, result. It collapses it. Right. And that's way, the way that super geometry allows us to perceive things in a different way that opens up ways of thinking that we couldn't uh, you know, uh, conceptualized with uh, only a two-state reality. Right. Um, well, it, it makes sense to me from a variety of reasons. One is, no matter what we look at from the quantum to the physical, we see repetitive patterns. We see repetitive geometry. Um, just a stupid example would be an atom and a solar system. Um, so we're sitting here perceiving the world with essentially three dimensions plus time. Time, right. has, time has defied definition. I mean, whether it's a dimension or something else. I mean, no one can agree on what time is. But if we take away time for a minute and we look at the three dimensions, it makes sense that reality would be three-dimensional in its makeup. In other words, it would be three-dimensional in its source points. Yeah, spatially. Spatially. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the word I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And if it is that way, what is that third spatial identifier? And it has to be a transitional state. Yeah. And, and that transitional state has to be able to interface with the two states we now are fully gripping and can't figure out why they don't come together because right. we're missing we're missing the middle you know we're missing the meat in the sandwich we've got well, bread on one side and the bread on the other but we don't have the meat yeah without without a third state to consider there is no middle there's only left or right that's why it doesn't connect yeah you it have, doesn't work. You have a piece of bread and a piece of bread mm -hmm. you need the middle state to make your sandwich you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But as we know, to a, to a materialistic inclined physicist, the uh, concept of having a non-physical aspect of reality is quite threatening. Well, we don't care about them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, 
They're, they're the they're, ones that have the particle accelerators, man. Yeah, that's true, but you know what? They're going to die soon, and then some new group of physicists that are a little more less ingrained with all of this ancient dinosaur thought process are going to be coming in, and they're going to start looking at this interface. <clears throat> and, and the whole secret to everything in research, as far as field research goes and experimental work goes, is not looking at this piece of bread or this piece of bread, we've got to look at the interface where they come together. And yeah. no one's doing that. No one is doing that. Well, that's because they don't accept that as a part of reality. Yes, but the reality is without it, you have no sandwich. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and they have no know, sandwich. <laughs> we know that science can be quite content or scientists can be quite atten content being able to, to determine what's happening without necessarily having to know why. Well, some do. Some it drives crazy. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, because they can't understand, you know, why they have a shoe and a pair of pants and they can't figure out why their foot hurts because they don't have a sock. And, and that sock is very important because it's the interface between the foot and the shoe. Mm hmm so without that interface, you have a lot of aggravation. And, and a lot of physicists are starting to come to that realization that there's something missing. Yeah. And, and what excites me about it is the paranormal may be the only place to gather evidence to connect the two. You took the words out of my mouth. I mean, <laughs> what, we've been, what we've been talking about, David, I mean, uh, you know, we're talking around these kinds of scientific ideas. Um, with these uh, emergent events, we really are uh, talking at the heart of how reality is put together. It's the mechanic of reality. Yeah, and it's not just spooks and gooks. It's the whole thing. It's, it's black holes. It's the Big Bang. It's, it, it's all it's of that. Galaxies. It's, you know, all of that. Yeah, it's everything. And, and, and here's, the, here's the other problem. When you look, science is so disciplined and the disciplines are so in a sandbox of their own. Yes. And you've got astrophysicists over here doing all this wondrous stuff, and the quantum physicists are going, oh, no, but it doesn't, this isn't, you know, it, that, I, you know you, you're missing something here. And they're like, no, we've got it all under control. The quantum physicists are going, oh, well, this is, this is Jesus here, you know, this is the God particle. This is what we're doing, and the astrophysicist is going, no, no, you're missing something. You see what I'm saying? Everybody's sure. missing something, but each discipline is so hardcore into their discipline, they've got blinders on and can't accept what these other disciplines are saying. Yes. So yeah, I mean, uh, none of them agree just, with each other. <clears throat> we could just take one example. Uh, if, uh, you know, if we accept the idea that information and you and I have talked about this often, the concept of information is something that is not only almost virtually ignored by the paranormal community. I mean, it's, it's, it's entirely ignored. Yeah, well, I don't know what that is. I mean, when I start talking about emerging information, I see jaws drop and people's mouths going agape because they're not grasping what we're saying. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean... Uh, they, they think we're talking about, you know, an EVP or message, and indirectly we are, but we're talking more about the mechanic of how that is emerging. Yeah, and without the, without the information on that electromagnetic carrier wave, you would just hear static. Exactly. You know, you would hear the information of the wave itself uh, and not the uh, modulations that, are, that the wave is carrying. Um, exactly. We need well, to demodulate that information, and something is doing that. When yes. we have a paranormal event, something is demodulating that information off that carrier, and it's having an effect on the environment, and it's having a quantitative effect on the environment. And, and people are just now, this is the reason why I'm so excited about this opportunity with ghost stalkers, is the fact that I can demonstrate some of this stuff and right now, all it is is woo factor. I mean, most yeah. of the people watching it, they're caught up in the woo factor. They're not really thinking about the implications of what it means. Right. And that's why I'm doing these uh, tech synopsis on YouTube after every show explaining 
what the experiment meant and what we found and how that fits into context with all this other stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the things, uh, if I can jump a little bit. Uh, jump around, man. We're just, we're, we're like two, 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 two old dudes like drinking coffee by the fire and shooting the shit. That's what we're yeah. doing. Yeah. <laughs> And you know you and I have to get together and have some private discussions like this. Oh, the phone, yeah, ab- absolutely. You know, <laughs> we have to just cut out the time for it, man. Uh, but uh, one of the things that had occurred to me, and, and, you know, I spent a lot of years putting together this theory, and paranormal phenomena for me was a, an essential um, body of data uh, <clears throat> that had to be accommodated within this model. It's an extremely valuable uh, 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 collection of evidence. But one of the things that occurred to me, David, is that, um, <clears throat> you know, based on anecdotal, uh, the, the overwhelming, uh, uh, you know, body of reports of, of paranormal events, right? We, we seem to have what I call a paranormal catalog, where, uh, you know, there are certain classes of phenomena certain events that occur within the paranormal realm, so to speak, and that these are the same kinds of events that are associated with this phenomenon, uh, so that uh, it's, to me, it's almost like a catalog. If we take a look at AVP, EVP, luminous phenomena, uh, you know, mystery breezes, uh, uh, you know, poltergeist type activity. When we put this all together, uh, we have a catalog of events that occur maybe not all together, except in the most extreme uh, cases. But when we talk about a paranormal experience or a paranormal event uh, or paranormal activity, we are talking about... uh, uh, you know, events, the kinds of occurrences that are included in this singular catalog. Now, oh, yeah, what, absolutely. Now, what that tells me is that the same set of mechanics is causing all of them. Exactly. That's, that, you know, this is something, this is a soapbox I've been standing on for a long time, is that all of this stuff has the same mechanic. And I'm, and I'm starting to make headway in it when I started to, and Eric is on here with me, when we were at the uh, uh, the hotel up in Napanock, the Shanley Hotel. Shanley, yeah. Uh, Eric is a gifted individual. He was present when I was doing these testings, and I was talking about these emerging properties, and he literally got to physically experience it, and then he got to visually experience the data at the same time. Yes, so he was present when all this stuff we're talking about actually manifested and was quantified in front of everybody. And he got it because he felt it as well as saw the data. Mm-hmm. And that was a sedge way for Eric to understand all this stuff that I've been talking about for years that everyone kind of scratches their head and says, God, oh, you're really smart, man. I wish you make my brain hurt. Uh, Eric, yeah, was yeah. Like, Eric was like, man, I get it. You know, it was like the light bulb went off over his head because he felt it and then he saw what he was feeling. Well, you realize that in the paranormal community, one of the uh, appeals, you know, the the appeal of it is that uh, you're not supposed to have to think that hard to enjoy it. (laughs) David, can I say something real quick? (laughs) Yeah, jump jump right in, Eric. What what I was going to say is the greatest thing about being able to... uh, see the information um, is it validates what you were feeling and, and a, a lot of people a lot of people yeah. already already can't trust their own intuitions when it comes to just survival yeah. instinct type things so when you start trying to get a little more esoteric they I mean you lose them very very quickly but like I said oh. when you're able to validate what you were feeling with you know recordable data yeah that that was a big kicker for me you know that's that's exactly right yeah that's exactly. so yeah and this is important uh, what's a good book say on the witness of two or more all things are confirmed right 
So you're looking at two different sources of witnesses, so to speak. Um, but, for example, what, what we're dealing with, I'm a firm believer in the idea that, you know, we start just naming these kinds of events, AVPs, EVPs, apparitions, cold spots, malfunctioning of electrical equipment, feelings of heaviness, um, levitation. Yeah. Uh, you know, all the poltergeist type activity, uh, all of these have to be explainable by a single set of mechanics that is consistent. Uh, and so that's the challenge because visually they all, and experientially they all look like completely separate things. So one person goes down the, uh, you know, the EVP path, so to speak, and they do all their thinking with the EVP and somebody else might go down the apparition path and some people might go down the residual haunting path or the live haunting path and so on and so forth and that pr approach doesn't work we've tried it for decades it doesn't work where well, it's not getting anywhere in the community and the thing is is that we know that all of those things are part of the same mechanic and instead of beating us you know taking <laughs> it's like floating in a sea of shit and selecting one turd and saying this turd offends me they all, <laughs> they, they, they all offend you you're just zeroing in on that one and saying this one this one offends me and and the thing is is that we that's have because to that's find, the one that you stepped on yeah it's yeah. got you trying to wipe it off your shoe so you're, you're sitting there looking at a myopic approach to something, that, and there's all this other stuff going on around you that's totally connected to it. Yeah. Absolutely, totally entwined. I mean, you know, and, and <laughs> I don't, and they wonder why they can only take it so far and not get any further, because you reach a boundary. And you've got to figure out what's beyond the boundary, and you've got to look at the interface. And when you start looking at interfaces, it all starts making sense. I mean, this is the whole pathway to getting to the quad, to getting to the EMF quadrilator, was bypassing all of this stuff that's manifesting because it's, it's a local effect. We're never going to get to the answer by measuring the local effect. We've got to find out what the source of the local effect is. And that's yeah. what led to discovering this emergence point. And that was, of all the things I've done, this... You know, discovering the emergence point is the vital eureka moment sure. because all of it is emerging from a same mechanic. Mm -hmm. the, the, everything that you named, all the specializations that you named are all from this emergence point. They have They're to be. all from this single source. Otherwise, has, we would, yeah, we would have to describe, you know, 50 different ways it would make a plant grow, so to speak. Exactly. You know, exactly. That's, that's irrational. It is irrational. So we're looking at information, which is all of that stuff, and it seems to be clustered around this point where it, it emerges into our reality, into our awareness, into our consciousness, into our ability to uh, associate physical terms to it. But it came from somewhere outside of that. That's right. And where and it came from is non-physical. Yeah. Yes, and, and and of course, you know, uh, what I talk about, and I know you're not a big fan of it maybe, but, you know. I think the, we're really talking the about the same thing. greatest physical To be honest with you, I mean, I look. Because, yep. <laughs> because the data is, is reflecting that. I mean, the, the experimental data is coming right back and saying, yeah. You know, and you can call it apples and I can call it oranges, but it's doing the same thing. Yeah. So it may be that we come up with totally new terminology for all of it before it's over with. It could happen. So I mean, for we me, just don't know. what we're dealing with, to me, and you know, I talk about uh, two classes of paranormal phenomena um, or two types. Uh, I talk about the... Um, you know, the class two or the type two, uh, which uh, which represents the 
changes that occur in the local environment, uh, or what I'd call secondary effects, changes that occur in the local environment that uh, set up the conditions that are necessary for a primary paranormal effect, which is right. the materialization of information within that localized, uh, changed, altered conditions. Right. Now, so I've made a little headway there. I've made a little headway there. Uh, I have so far been able to associate high energy discharge with <clears throat> accompanying emerging information. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, and what I've been doing is playing around with a Tesla coil. And you know, Tesla claimed a lot of things. I mean, he claimed he was even communicating with someone on Mars and all this other stuff. <clears throat> but Tesla was dealing with emerging information. Mm -hmm. And he had these huge Tesla coils that were constantly discharging in his laboratory. I mean, he would sit and write papers in the light of this lightning he was generating. Now, we know from <clears throat> studies in our atmosphere that lightning creates antimatter. So we've got we've got an interface occurring where intentional high energy discharge is creating antimatter. That's just something that we, we've discovered recently within the last 10 years. Yes. Now, if we edge that further along the envelope, high energy discharge may be a simplistic way of opening that veil. If it's only just punching a small hole through at the time of discharge, at that moment of discharge, it still may be a trigger or a enabling boost, so to speak, to set that process into motion. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I've, I can't say that that's for sure what's going on, but I do have a series of unusual coincidences at this point so and and amazingly um, some of that's going to show up in this series oh, some of that good. work's going to show up in the series and as usual you know I'm going to leave it up and, and I'm at the mercy of the editors you know they're, oh, they're sure. going to put it together and cut chop it and take a lot of stuff out yeah. but the payoff is there associating high energy discharge with um maybe even pair production occurring where we're creating matter. Mm -hmm. So these are things that are baby steps. And it's like when I talk with John Tenney, you know, and oh, we sort of have the same dialogue going, what we're trying to do with the show is to take some baby steps into the next level. Mm -hmm. And so far, so good. So far, the, and Eric, have you had a chance to watch any of it? I, I have not had a chance. I, I, I'm also, I do not get that particular channel. Um, well, go online to Destination America to Ghost Stalker's show site, and you can get the experiments because they are using my experimental segments as part of the teasers. So you can see the, see the experiment unfold. I did see, my wife and I did watch the first episode. Because it was on YouTube, right? Uh, well, yes, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I, I will say this it's refreshing the show the first thing about the show was it was yeah. refreshing in its approach um, and the way it's set up and the way it was done I, I didn't become uh, offended yeah. because it treated me like I was stupid it's all yeah. it, it, it lets you make your own decisions and that's, I, I have to applaud it for that well, well that's one of the things I do I, don't, I, I suggest what it may be but I really pretty much let, I don't reach a conclusion. And I, cause I want the audience to think about it. I want people, cause someone out there is going to say, you know, I got something that can add to that. And someone's going to come to us and say, Hey, have you thought about this? And that's going to open up a whole new door of looking at how to, to prove this stuff. And, I mean, I'm already starting to get that. I'm already starting to get people. Have you tried doing such and such? Have you tried that? So all in all, this is a vehicle that I have tried in the first season to, Hook people. 
Well, and my, my, of course, me, because of the experience at the Shanley, my first yeah. question was, I wonder if the waveform that he's picking up on these active locations on the quadrilator, if the waveform was the same, because it was a very unique waveform. Yeah, see, the, the waveform that we caught on the handheld is a very localized manifestation, more so than the actual paranormal event itself. That's a subset of data that's a emerging bit of information <clears throat> from, as, as Tom calls it, the bubble. We're looking at the bubble data. That data is sub-bubble data. That's data coming from the bubble itself. So when we're looking at the quadrilator, we're looking at the bubble. Right. We're looking at the event horizon. The, Correct. The point of where it's happening. The data we collected locally on you and on Tracy, that's a subset. That's data that's coming from the bubble itself, not from the formation of the bubble and its effect on the environment. That's information that's pure coming from the bubble itself. Yeah, so, so I call materializing information. That's the materializing information. See, the, the, the quadrilator detects the bubble. It detects the location of where it's happening. The handheld device I had is a more localized device and works in a very small area of effect, and that's allowing us to pick up the actual emerging information itself. And that's the difference between the two devices. The quadrilator is looking at a room to physically place the anomaly. Okay, we've got this coming out, and it's equidistance between these two sensors. It must be there. You know, like this sensor is at the same level as this sensor is over here, so it's between those two sensors. So we're physically placing the, the emergence point with the quadrilator. What the handheld EMF detector is doing is it's literally looking at the information specific to the emergence. Yeah, the modulations. Yeah, we're looking yes. at that yes. carrier wave and what that carrier wave has on it. <coughs> exactly. That yeah. we can't get with the quadrilator. We're not going to get that type of function with the quadrilator. What the quadrilator is measuring is this and this. What we were measuring was coming out of this. You see what I'm saying? That's why both of those devices are vital. One's, one's vital to determine where to take the other device to. In no, other words, a, go if ahead, I can uh, interject something, uh, uh, speaking of devices, I was talking to Barry Fitzgerald again today. Okay. Uh, he's very, very anxious at the three of us getting together in the very near yeah. future for a phone conference. And I told him I was waiting on you to give us a time and a date. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that piece of equipment, I can't even remember its name, that he sent me the clip to and I forwarded to you. Right. Uh, uh, what application can that be adapted uh, to paranormal research? Now, I've looked at a couple of things, and so I, I've got to put it back into perspective. Was he the one that had the, ca the camera? that was looking at that fluid effect of the air? Yes, yes. I have gone so far as to write to the professor who developed that, and he has not responded. I think I scared him away when I used the word paranormal. Oh, you bad boy. Um, but I told him I was researching reports of a phenomena associated with paranormal uh, events, and that I was anxious to duplicate that apparatus in a field application, and I have not heard a response from him. Okay, um, so you've taken that next step on that. Well, and I don't know how far it's going to go because I, you know, he's a professor. You know, a professor's time is like my time is right now. They got no time for anything but dealing with class and dealing with their schedule and everything else. I'll probably hear from him sometime around June or July when he's not working. Um, that's how generally they are because uh, professors are sort of myopic with what has to be done right now. Um, mm -hmm. And people like me are kind of like get thrown into a folder and they go through that when they got spare time at some point in the year. Um, mm -hmm. But I'll tell you how that will work. That's going to allow us to film a room and possibly detect visually this event, this yes. source point. 
Yes. Because what there will it, be it will be a disturbance. Like? Yeah. Yeah. It'll be a physical disturbance. And I'm I'm trying to do this with smoke, which is very primitive, because yes. smoke is a kind of non controllable item. Um, and I'll tell you what you don't see in the TV show. You don't see the four and a half hours I spend implicating structural controls in the environment. For mm -hmm. example, sealing the room, making sure the room is sealed so there's no drafts, checking the room with a handheld anemometer to make sure there's no drafts, to get it narrowed down to the only thing that could be moving the smoke is convection. In other words, temperature differentials. And a temperature differential should make the smoke rise or fall. But what it won't do is create vortexual movement in the smoke. So we're going to look for vortexual movement in the smoke. Um, but yet the, the interaction, and this is one of the arguments that I make, that some of the things that we, uh, that we observe uh, in association with uh, paranormal uh, events, occurrences, are to me a result of the interaction between this emerging bubble of space-time and the surrounding physical content. And so the outer edge of this may very well be vortexual. And but listen to what I'm saying, and you're confirming it. The fact that we would get a vortex indicates that it's there. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't necessarily explain it. It identifies the spot where it's happening. Yeah. And that's another way of looking at, we're looking at it now totally like identifying the EMF emergence and pinpointing the location where it's emerging from. That's part of it. Now, if we can look at a visual manipulation of the environment by the same thing, in other words, if eventually down the road we can get evidence of EMF emerging at the same time get evidence of the environment reacting at the same spot then now suddenly we've correlated two pieces of data mm -hmm. and that the overall long run of that is is that something is going on there something that's not part of the natural environment is happening there mm -hmm. and that's two pieces of information that's demonstrating that Yes. Now, what that is, we have to take it the next step. But at least we're identifying that it's real and it's there. And it's at that location. And that's what's important about what I'm doing right now is it's identifying it as being real and being in a specific location. Yes. And I have to do that, you know, in six minutes per episode. Yes. <laughs> so... So that's, that's the big challenge. But even though that is very limited knowledge, it's huge knowledge. Because now it's saying, hey, there's something emerging and it's right there. Now, if we take that camera and we're looking at the camera there, all of a sudden now we've got a disturbance associated with where the machinery is saying, we've got something emerging here. And I think it's right there. And then all of a sudden you've got a camera anomaly right there that's showing this, maybe even seeing it emerging into the environment with that camera. Now, that would be huge. That's yes. what that camera is going to do for paranormal investigating is it may be able to identify the disturbance being created by the emerging information. Yes. I like it. Yeah, so I'm pretty excited about that camera, and it appears to use standard equipment except for the laser. The key part of that whole thing is bending that laser, in other words, to light the environment with this laser by bending it in the fashion that they're bending it at. Mm. So, I mean, I can't tell enough about it from the video to duplicate it, and that's where I need to talk to that professor and say, hey, what exactly is this interface you're using here to light up the environment with? And that's essentially what they're using the laser for is to light up the environment in a specific way. Because mm -hmm. they're bending the light around to do this. And that's the whole crux of the biscuit is bending that light around. 
<laughs> so it looked like it was a pretty big apparatus. It looked like it took up a lot of space. And it also looked like it was very, almost a calibrated setup. And I'm sure it is. Yeah. Like, like a micrometer off here fucks the whole thing up and you can't do it. That's so, okay. So I don't know. These are things that I can't tell from looking at the video because the video is a woo video. It's, you know, hey, look at this, woo. You know? Yeah. Now, uh, uh, um, Barry did tell me that he thought that that video was about 15 years old. Well, it would be interesting if some of that stuff was miniaturized and compartmentalized. So That's that exactly be, what he said. <laughs> so that it could be easily set up. Um, because if it could be, then it becomes a whole new ball game then. And then the trick is is to reproduce it uh, and make it rugged enough to where you can travel with it and set it up relatively quickly and operate it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm very interested in it. That's a, that is an incredible tool. In fact... I showed the producer or the executive producer of the show, Nick Groff, I showed him that video and he was like, we need to get that. Yeah. We need to get one of those. And uh, so I'm, I'm trying to, to work on that. And I'm hoping that, you know, at some point, if I can, that we can debut something like that in the next season. Um, I'm going to want to play with it, though, before I go out and make a fool of myself on national television. Sure, of course. But the prospect of it, from what I can see, looks awesome. I mean, the, the first thing that went through my mind is, is, oh, my God, here's a way that we can maybe show that emerging information, not so much as the information itself, but the disturbance that's created by the emergence of the information. Yeah, that, that localized change in the conditions. Yeah, see, uh, that's, that's, that's our real ghost. Yes. See, we're looking at a real ghost in that. Because that's telling us that there is something doing it, and there's the sign of it. That's the, 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 the sign that it's happening. Even though we're measuring it and seeing it and we're doing all these other things, now we've got a visual look at that environment being disturbed at that exact same spot. And you know, now we've got correlating data from several sources saying it's right there. there yeah, it and, it's, and the visual that it gives us... Uh, I would predict is going to be consistent with the model that we're proposing. I agree. I think it will be too. Not only that, we may learn something from the emergence depiction itself that may actually help fingerprint part of the mechanic. Yeah. And so th these are all things that are running through my head that that may be a device that kicks us up to the next level. Um, now we know what it looks like, how it's configured, how it affects the environment. Now let's see if we can get beyond that. You know, let's take it the next step forward. How can we measure this or that or what's causing the disturbance, you know? And eventually we're going to get right to the, the right to the event horizon, right where it becomes reality. And that's what we want to see. That's what we want to measure. That's what we want to analyze is that part in our reality where it actually is converting to our reality and by understanding that process that's going to give us a huge insight as to what's going on yeah could even tell us why the universe is lumpy exactly it could <laughs> tell us it could tell us all sorts of things yeah yeah um so i mean i'm looking at it like frothing at the mouth saying we want one we need one how can we get one i'm glad to hear it david that, that's encouraging because when Barry talked to me about it again tonight. I told him, look, I'm a pencil pusher, man. David's the guy who's the engineer. Yeah. You know, he's my go-to man on all this stuff, you know, because I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you know, like I said, when you sent me that video and I watched it, I mean, you know, my brain just started firing off. And I started thinking, you know, if I can assemble, you know, three or four different data sets to look at this point, Maybe we can start defining the point. Yeah, start actually building a real model. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So Very I was exciting. pretty excited. Yeah, I was pretty excited about it. Now, you know, is this going to be like the lure instead of the bait? You know, is this going to be the lure that we bite into and it's just a piece of cork with hooks on it? Or, you know, because we never can get the device or, we, you know, whatever. Is it a teaser, you know, that we're going to just sit here and lament about for the next 10 years? Or are we actually going to be able to get our hands on one of these things and be able to put it through its paces? 
that's where we're at. Mm. Well, if somebody's got enough money to toss in a certain direction, anything could happen. Oh, yeah, because I could walk right into the guy's office and plop down a stack of bills and say, I want one, get it. You know, yep. make it happen. Yep. Yeah. You know, like but, Krusty the Clown said, what do you want me to do? They drove a truck full of money up to my door. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, you know, you there's, there's nothing that money can't buy except for love, maybe. So, yeah. but anyway, so we're out of time again, Tom. And uh, much as I hate to say it, this always happens. But uh, another fruitful extension of the past conversation. Um, yes. We are we are going to be in uh, in kind of a stasis for a bit, so I'm not really going to be able to announce what's going to happen within the next few weeks yet because we're we're scrambling to come up with something, and uh, but I will let you know where we go from here. And uh, thanks for being on our show as usual. Well, thanks for having me, David, and. Uh if you can, really try to uh, email me with uh, or message me with some sort of a uh, yeah. date time. So at least we can get this rolling. Yeah, I'll tell, mean, you, I tell you what's happening right now, just so you know. It's like I work 10 hours a day on the day job because I have to commute an hour both ways. Mm-hmm. Then I get home and I end up doing two or three interviews. And then by the time I do my email and I catch up on the other social media things that I've got to take care of. It's four o'clock in the morning and I got to be up at six. That's been my life since the show started. So, yeah. And it's going to be like that for a little while. So it's going to take a little bit. Um, probably I'm hoping within three weeks after the last episode airs, this should die off a little bit. And then I should be able to allot some time to have a serious discussion. Well, that'd be good because Barry said that in a few weeks he's going to be uh, basically finished with his public appearances and those kinds of things until the end right. of the year. So that might yeah, work see, out very well. I'm thinking we're probably looking towards like maybe Thanksgiving before Thanksgiving at some point uh, for where all of us are probably going to be in a point where we can sit down and talk for a period of time. And that's really what we need to do. So, Okay. So just kind of tell him that we're kind of on the same schedule, that probably be three, maybe four weeks at the max, and we'll probably have some time then that we can coordinate everything. Sounds good to me, David. All right. Well, again, thanks, Tom, for coming on the show tonight. It's always fun talking with you because we get into such cool conversations that we rarely get into with anyone else. So uh, it's always fun. So thanks for being on, and uh, we'll see you soon. Yeah, information, big bang, spooks, gooks. Thank you very much. Yeah, next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, have you had a chance to watch any of the new show? Mm, no. <laughs> I, I, well, first well, you, well, you don't get it, number one. But I will say they, uh, they have it on Amazon now. To where you can download it to your computer, and I think it's like a dollar ninety nine uh, an episode. I see. And and once you pay for it, of course, you know you can watch it as many times as you want. But um, yeah, yeah. and and they do that so that you know it, it makes up for the lack of sponsorship that they have on the TV. You know, you know they're going to have to make a little bit of money off of it. But a dollar ninety nine per episode is not so bad because you don't have to sit through you know tons of commercials and stuff. Like when you're watching at home. But anyway, if you do get a chance, you can go to the website at Destination America, and my clips are actually the teasers. Oh. So they're using me. They're using the majority of my FaceTime as the teaser clip. Now, they have a teaser clip of the guys doing stuff, too. Uh-huh. Um, so, But so far, each one of my segments is almost in full as a teaser clip. So it will give you a pretty good overview of where I'm going with all of this. Well, that's good. What what happened on the first episode, we had the EMF quadrilator operating, and we actually picked up a response when a medium was asking a question to whatever was there. 
And that's sort of demonstrated. And we only saw one of them, and it happened numerous times during the, the filming. But they only showed one because they only had time to show one. But what that demonstrated was not only this emerging background information, but there was a human interaction on that. In yes. other words, when the human person interacted with whatever was there, we had a dramatic alteration in the waveform. And it was almost a pattern between two different sensors. And it showed two out-of-phase spikes in opposite directions, so almost triangular in shape that cross both sensors. It was almost like both sensor inputs, you know, spanned across. Yeah, that's on that uh, that's on that YouTube clip that you yeah, said that too. Yeah, the YouTube clip has that on there. But uh, that that was that was literally on the T V station website or the T V network website on, you know, destinationamerica.com. Now the second episode also shows a good portion <clears throat> of my segment. And what we did on that one was is I used smoke, theatrical smoke, and a laser system. And we started out using like these little three milliwatt pens or whatever like they use on the other TV shows that I won't mention. But the problem with those is they're not powerful enough to print over the IR wash that we were using to light up the room. So you couldn't see it. And what's so important about all of this, and if we do experiments, I want to videotape them. It's got to be visual to the people watching it, or they're taking your word for an explanation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I had to do was to make it very visual in the design of the experiment. So we ended up using these fairly powerful lasers and we projected a pattern. And then in the middle of it all, Chad, of course, got attacked by something and his back got all scratched up. And that was pretty dramatic and stuff. But uh, towards the end of the episode, you see the fruits of the experiment because what actually happened was some type of shadow creature or object or person sort of figure. Up, yeah, figure. Actually, figure. Figure. Sort yeah. of peeked up over the far wall, and when they peeped up over the wall, it blocked out the laser beam. You didn't see the laser beam print on it. Mm -hmm. What you saw was the laser beam being obscured by it, almost like it was being absorbed. But at the same time, if you look at it closely, it became almost backlit for a brief moment. And you see a silhouette of it from being lit from behind, and there was no light source behind it. And what's even funnier is where that takes place. There's like a three-foot deep pile of construction debris. A person can't even get to where that figure was without climbing over boards, you know, that are all helter-skelter and different types of sheetrock and just crap that's piled there. Uh -huh. So I couldn't even go there during the test when I was demonstrating how it would print on a human body no matter where you were in the room. I right. tried to walk over to the other side of that wall, couldn't get to it because of all the crap that's in there. And, of course, it was pitch dark, so you couldn't see without a flashlight. And the guys are using their cameras to see with because they can't see an IR light. So they're having to look in their camera viewfinder to navigate, to even walk around in there. Right, right. But, but what that demonstrated is I had proposed that shadow people may be a form of anti-photonic life form where, you know, human beings... We generate photons. We emit photons from our DNA at a cellular level. And I also mentioned about the Rhine Center doing uh, all this research, and that never got on either after I reviewed the evidence. I mentioned the Rhine Center has a photon counter where they're counting ultraviolet photons. Right. And they have created a black room. And in this black advocate, we will be without Stephen tonight. He uh, called me earlier and said he had to take his wife somewhere. I hope I hope you didn't mean like you know to bury her or anything. Um, but uh, uh, we're on. We're going to continue our conversation tonight with uh, Tom Fusco, who is being camera shy this week, and uh, we're going to pick up where we left off and talk about uh, all sorts of things. So, Thomas, how are you doing tonight? Oh, great, David. Thanks. Yourself. Oh, I'm hanging in there, believe me. I'm running around from one interview to the next to the next. What so a man. Life life is getting insane. 
Um, so let's see. When we left off, we were talking about all sorts of things, but we went over on last week's show because we got into an interesting conversation. Pretty much because Stephen was stirring the uh, shit pot. So um, let's try to pick up now. <clears throat> We are going to take a bullet list of your theory and we are going to work off that bullet list and start designing specific experiments to prove each item listed. That's the backstory to this whole thing. So, uh, and we were discussing your trip to the symposium and uh, let's just jump right back in and pick up not even necessarily where we left off. Let's just grab a piece of turf and start working it out. All right, David. Uh, with the bullet list, I've started to work on it. And, you know, you know how sometimes when you, uh, you go to work on something, you envision it being a certain way. And then when you start working on it. <laughs> it doesn't turn out that way. Yeah, it's like, you know, <laughs> this isn't really fleshing out in the kind of form that I was uh, yeah, imagining it. So, what it began to uh, uh, take the form of is kind of a, uh, almost like a scientific paper. And, yeah, that's, that's okay, but my request is, is that we keep each subject at least compartmentalized. Uh -huh. so, so we can pick like a paragraph for each item so that we can pick that paragraph out to be the um, preamble, if you will. Mm -hmm. to a specific set of experiments or a specific experiment. That was yeah. my only... I mean, you know, how I was doing it before was reading through your book and trying to do it that way, and that's very cumbersome for me. Um, reading your book and enjoying it is not cumbersome. However, <laughs> reading your book and trying to design an experiment becomes a, a system of page flipping back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, I started to uh, uh, write this down, and then I uh, realized that, well, gee, Tom, you kind of really, you do have to com uh, uh, compartmentalize it, like, like you said, David. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, it needs to take a logical form, a logical sequence. This is A, this exactly. is B, this is C. Right. And so that's where it began to... Uh, uh, kind of take on the form of a of a paper, but it'll still be in in kind of an outline form. Yeah, uh, that 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 was um, really you know I, I didn't expect you to bullet point it to be honest. Um, that would be like me trying to bullet bullet point you know my theory. It's really just not possible. It's more like paragraph assemblage, mm -hmm. and then assembling each paragraph in the proper order. You know. Yeah, and that's what I'm sure you're 